Unforeseen Voyage by Arthur Telling I was at a table in Salute's, a charming restaurant perched beside the Richmond Marina on the San Francisco Bay. I was having a late lunch, alone, as I often do. A glass of good California wine and a fine meal is what I deem to be a good fun afternoon. I had expected the day to be ordinary like any other. It was not. My ordeal began with a man crying out, All aboard! Breaking the ambience. I had no idea who said it or why, but astonished I was when the restaurant began moving slowly away from the wharf. For this restaurant was nailed down solidly to the earth next to the bay, on piers at the water's edge. Other guests continued to eat, drink, and be merry as though nothing out of the ordinary was happening. I got up and went to a window. The restaurant was lumbering along at a good five knots and I could hear the engine chugging. I felt that I was on a ghost ship with an assemblage of people on a voyage that they had neither planned nor desired, yet strangely... No one but I had a thought of concern. A man came into our dining area, waving a lantern. He did not look out of place. The restaurant was something like a ship, with several dining rooms, hallways, and entranceways, and even an almost grand stairway at the entrance. I asked the man carrying the lantern how and why we had left the dock. He gave me a strange look and had a most peculiar grin. We're on our way, he said in a dull, flat voice, looking ominously serious. Where to? I responded. But he walked on. I thought best to stay and sit and be calm. Watching the bay rippling along the harbor, I began to wonder about my existence. Me struggling along on a ride through life, growing older and watching things change, yet knowing not where I will eventually be. Leaving the harbor on the strange floating restaurant, I felt that I would eventually reach the end of the sea and fall off of the world as it seems to happen upon death. I wondered if I was dreaming, for I had eaten here numerous times and know for certain that it is anchored securely atop pilings along the waterfront, very entrenched on the land and definitely not afloat out on the bay. But it could not have been a dream. It was very real. The restaurant picked up speed and made an abrupt turn, setting it dead on course for the mouth of the Golden Gate. We are heading out to sea, I said, but other restauranters, showing no interest, continued to eat the fine food the restaurant was serving. Speeding along at a brisk pace, we reached the mouth of the Golden Gate and went under the magnificent bridge, which for the past 75 years has guarded the entrance to the San Francisco Bay. The bright orange towers of the bridge stood far higher and grander than I had ever seen, perhaps twice that from a normal roadway height. I watched, hypnotized in awe, as we came under and through And then from the other side, the bridge slowly became smaller and hazy, a cool mist lowering the vision between me and it until it became light gray, still with graceful silhouette contrasting against the smooth, natural flow of the San Francisco hillsides, lush with now hazy gray trees, grasses, and dirt. I snapped back to reality, cognizant that we were now out in the ocean, and the restaurant was still lumbering along, like an old trawler, but with all passengers except me disinterested in this unscheduled and ghastly voyage. The soberness of the moment hit me. I had become so disoriented that I couldn't remember the circumstances behind my entry into the restaurant. Was I there having an office lunch, as I so often do? Or was this a weekend or evening event. From the position of the sun, I guessed it was late midday, well past lunch. 
I was out in the Pacific Ocean, disoriented and lost in a reality filled with people, and just myself in distress. I got up and peered through a window frame of the aged old restaurant. I saw just ocean and a blue cloudless sky, the sea moderately rough, sending white caps over the tops of a rhythmic pattern of large swells. I walked about, staring enviously at the other people, all of whom seemed content and happy, drinking wine or sipping coffee and partaking in the restaurant's French bread and olive oil. I felt like the biblical Adam looking in on a Garden of Eden whose inhabitants accept their given roles and identities, not ever thinking about life's greater meaning, content living what seems a meaningful life. It is something of which Western philosophers have beckoned with. We, our eyes opened, must search out and find the answers to this riddle of mortal existence. We will not be here sipping wine and eating pasta forever. This restaurant will at some time pull into a harbor, and we will be herded out, perhaps like cattle, and go to the next drama awaiting us. What this might be, I could only imagine. I had no knowledge base or experience of heading out to open sea in what was supposed to be a restaurant sitting on the dry earth. I began scanning my surroundings, focusing on the eyes of each of the restaurateurs, but met none. Everyone was a stranger, and everyone seemed content eating and conjoling, none noticing the wide spray of water welling up at the front of the restaurant as it moved further out into the ocean, or perhaps abyss, as I was beginning to think. How could this be? Why didn't anybody realize it? I thought about my friend Granger. We had chatted many times happily through the evening about our purpose or non-purpose in living. What a relief it would be to see him now. Anger welled up as I looked about at these strangers, so oblivious to this shared predicament. Where the hell were we going? I felt very alone. Near despair, I sat down at a table and stared into the horizon, which we were now barreling toward. Water and white caps was all I could see, the brisk blue sky fading to a purple red in the distance. Red sky at night, sailor's delight, I recited, but felt no delight in this bewitching moment. I stared blankly in front of me and saw a small man with glasses staring back blankly. He was at the next table alone. Hoping to share my concerns, I jumped up and asked if I could sit with him. He motioned with his hand to take a seat and broke into a warm smile. Quite a beautiful sunset, he said. Yes, I replied and was about on the edge of my seat wondering what to blurt out next. Good food was my next reflective sound. Yes, very good, he replied, and asked if I were from around here. It gave me the opening that I was craving for. Here? Where are we? The little man looked up at me with puzzlement. Where are we? Well, I'm here enjoying this fine lasagna, and here are you without a thing in front of you. Let me buy you a drink. He motioned for the waiter, but I waved him off. I wanted nothing. I turned to the stranger and asked him where he thought we were headed. Good question, he responded. I believe it will be a prosperous good year. I pointed out to the sea and said, no, out there. He strained his eyes, took off his glasses, and looked again. Beautiful sunset, he said. This man and me were not on the same wavelength. My feeling of despair returned. I thanked him for his hospitality, got up, and moved back to the empty table next to his. I was alone, all alone. Still without knowledge of my destination, I began examining my thoughts and feelings. I had to put this together and come to some kind of resolution or perhaps go mad. 
I struggled with all that I possessed, a wealth of accumulated knowledge given my age and background. I settled on this being a living symbol of my mortal existence. It would end, but without hint as to when or where. The thought comforted me, and I mused over the idea that this vessel would make port entirely out of the world, in heaven, the afterlife. The idea excited me, and I considered how these other poor mortals were going about eating and drinking, but without comprehension of their impending transformation, which no doubt, when it occurred, would leave them without a clue to even the thought that they had changed. If they fell from here into a coal mine, they would happily begin shoveling coal without thinking about how they had gotten there or why. I wondered where I could possibly be when the strange void ended, as it must. It is odd how we so fear change, yet grumble over the repetitive nature of our present. Already I was finding comfort in the permanency of this afternoon adventure, in no small part due to my apprehension over what would happen at the end of this cruise. We identify with what we do. I was presently a restaurant here, a patron at a fine restaurant. I didn't want it to end. I moved to the front of this moving barge and peered out ahead as hard and far as I was able. I saw only sea and sky, and the boat stayed at its brisk and steady pace, giving me a sense that it had a purpose and goal. What, though? I wondered. Where could we be going? A waiter appeared and asked me what I would like. I was feeling hungry and said I'd have the clam pasta, a favorite of mine, and a glass of wine, a dry white, a fumé blanc. He nodded politely and left. The sun was setting, and I began to appreciate the extravagant view, the fine linen, the exquisite decor, and the pleasant ambience of the patrons. Life is good, I thought. A glass of wine dropped onto my table. I sipped it. It was cool to the touch, but warm and good. Oh, yes, life is fine, I thought. A brief wait and the pasta arrived. I delved into it slow and careful. The meals that we eat are a high point of our day. We should cherish each one, more each bite. The clams were cooked in the shell, circled around the pasta that sat at the center of the plate, a sprig of parsley strategically placed atop. With a small fork, I took the pasta and scooped out the clams from their shells one by one. I looked about. Through the window, the fine sunset was at its most magnificent stage, a deep red sun halfway down into the water. In this perfect world, I wondered how a person could ever have a worry or concern. I must have dozed off. For in front of me was a depleted wine glass and plastic bellfold. I opened the bellfold, squinting to read it. The bill was $42. Four glasses. I had remembered just the first glass. Feeling calm but drowsy, I put cash in the belt bolt and started to get up to leave. But a large man came up and told me to sit down. I did reflexively, and he sat down too, facing me. Fool, he snapped. You're on a ride to nowhere. He gazed out through the window pane. He was right. I had forgotten. Where are we going? My anxiety began seeping back in. A stern look crossed his face, and he shrieked out that we were lost in a sea of nothing, knowing not where we have been nor where we are going. And a glow came over me as I realized that this threatening man was just who I had been frantically looking for. He was not like the others, making merry with wine and food, like me, he was aware and cognizant of our strange happenings. Then he disappeared, leaving so quickly that I couldn't fathom which way he went. I jumped up and headed towards an adjoining room, then walked about the restaurant searching, but I sensed that I was reliving an earlier moment when this ordeal first began. Sheepishly, 
I returned to my table and thought maybe the man would come back, but he couldn't know I was aware of our odd predicament. He had not given me the time to express it. Surely we would again cross paths before the night ended. There was nowhere to be but this rapidly moving restaurant. Gathering my thoughts, I strained to imagine this voyage ending. In my mind, I conjured up a return voyage under the Golden Gate, over the bay, and into the Richmond Marina, the reverse of how we had left. The sun had set, and it was dark, except for the lights inside the restaurant. But far off, I saw two hazy but distinct vertical strings of light. It was the two towers of the Golden Gate, lit in their majesty by the strong floods lights at the surface. We drifted under and I saw the lights of the Richmond Harbor. We were back. Me and other patrons lined up at the doorway, forming a 20-foot line. The restaurant's front door opened and we began filing out in pairs. The cool air of the night told me that this ordeal had ended. I glanced to my left and saw there the man with the penetrating eyes. But he was looking straight ahead. The parking lot was dark, but began to light up with the headlights of cars revving their engines and shuttling out of the parking lot. I stood in the lot and watched as they left, feeling as though I had come to the end of a long but successful journey. I hopped in my car, now alone in the dark lot, and started for home. I glanced once more at the restaurant, now dark. On the steps, silhouetted against the sky, was a large man, the man with the penetrating eyes, menacing looking now, and staring right at me. Fear welled up in me. I hurried on home. In my armchair, through the window, I see the sun's powerful red-yellow rays breaking through the last remnants of the evening's dark blue-black mysteries. The morning display is a grandiose demonstration of what is good. Life is awakening as it does each morning. I chuckle as I think about the man with the penetrating eyes, recalling the sight of him in silhouette as I drove away from the restaurant. Has he yet found his way home? I wonder.